I'm supposed to speak to you tonight about the topic of egalitarianism. Answering egalitarian arguments, the abstract says that I'll deal with scriptures, etc., that are twisted in terms of the egalitarian viewpoint. Uh, frankly, I probably won't do that. But uh, frankly, here's what I would like to do tonight. I will, along the way, answer some egalitarian arguments, but my true desire would be to help each of us better appreciate the creation order and its blessing in a culture that's bent on its destruction by revising Scripture to fit their culture rather than letting the Word of God mold their culture. Now, it is evident the world about us isn't going to let the Word of God mold our culture, mold their culture. The proof of that only goes back to Genesis chapter 4. Therefore, frankly, the only thing we can really hope for is that the church doesn't let the world mold their spiritual faith and outlook on the viewing of the role of men and women in the kingdom of God. It's obvious we're not going to change the culture of the whole world. So what we have to be concerned about is, is that the culture of the world doesn't change the church's thinking according to the word of God. That's really where it's at. Frankly, when uh, this articulate brother called me and spake to me in the phone, he said, we'd just like for you to say something about Miriam, Deborah, and Huda. And of course, I was taken in. Didn't realize what a prickly subject it would be as a male speaking about ladies in a day and age when I found out I'm only a social construct. So that really makes it difficult. It would seem essential the first thing I would need to do is at least to give you some limited definition of what we mean by egalitarian. The teaching in essence is the Bible teaches that the roles of service or ministry in the church today is not restricted. Women should have unrestricted roles in the work of the church. So women should be appointed to teach and oversee in the church just as men do. That's really what this is about. They consider the establishment of male headship, they like to use the word dominate, is due to sin entering the world according to Genesis chapter 3 and that Christ then restored the original order in Galatians 3 and 28 where it says there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. So we can basically say that this is the idea that women should have unrestricted ministry in the church and oversight in the church. But let's try to give that a little bit of a biblical base. What they would basically say is, in Genesis chapter 1, God created man. Man here, of course, is generic for humankind. For humankind. Added to that, maybe, would be a little verse over in Genesis chapter 2 about took the rib from man. So the point is, this points out what? Equality. Equality. Now there was a distinction between male and female. But basically he made man, that's humankind, in the image of God, differentiating male and female. So in that sense, they are absolutely what? They are absolutely equal. And in this particular Genesis 1 and 2, they would simply say equality of male and female is there and that there is no reference whatsoever to the idea of roles with the thought of headship and helpership. This is the egalitarian approach. But in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, where it speaks, of course, of you remember the curse that came. 
they'll say this is where headship and helpership originated. Now this is critical to our reading and study of the Bible. And they're saying that here we simply have equality, male and female, but every role is mutual. But with Genesis 3, 16, this is where the idea of headship and head, uh, helpership came in. And you have one dominating another. And then Christ comes and he restores the original order in Galatians 3 and 28. Neither male nor female, you know, Jew, Gentile, slave and free person. So what they're saying is that in the beginning, God created man, that's humankind, <coughs> equal, differentiated male and female, but they can all have the same roles because that was the equality. And then in Genesis 3.16, it all changed with the curse. And here's where headship and helpership comes in, domination of roles. And then Christ comes in Galatians 3.28. And of course, he restores the original order of what they say is the original simply equality. Well, I'm over here and I got the thing. I might as well do this. Okay. Now, when we look at the Bible, what do we see? What we're going to see in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Yes, God created man, humankind, male and female. But we see in Genesis 2, when it goes through this, it is very evident that man is given the role of headship. There are too many things focusing here that emphasize the headship of man. When, they, when we come then in the scriptures to Genesis uh, 3 and 16, what this is saying is, is that headship and helpership are already here, but in sin they are what? It is then corrupted. It's then corrupted. And then when we move back down through here, it wouldn't be the verse they would put. But when Christ restores the order, the point is simply Ephesians 5 and 33, where we still have what? That the husband, the head, is to be what? He is to love his wife, and the wife is to show what? Respect unto the husband. So if there's a restoration, it's simply to keep following that order. Uh, basically, what this means is, is that a husband, you husbands are going to love this. But you're to be a sacrificial lovers. You're to be a sacrificial lover. Uh, you ladies, because you're godly, will accept this. You're not only a helper, but you'll be a submissive helper. I think you know there's a difference between a helper and a submissive helper. You've worked with some of them, haven't you? I leave that alone. But this gives you the basic a biblical little background of, of the two uh, that we have. So we have kind of given a little idea. To the contrary to the egalitarian viewpoint, the scriptures indicate equality of male and female, for both were made in the image of God. Both are humankind, and both share in the same salvation granted by Jesus unto all humankind by grace through faith. So we have equality in terms of the fact that male, they're differentiated male and female, but they're both what? Humankind. But it has this really, this is really lovely. And that is not only do you have equality, because you're humankind, but you have equality because we both are one in Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, we've been given the right to both be one. That, my brothers and sisters, is wondrous. In 1 Peter 3 and 7, this equality is backed up. 
It says there, Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. But listen, underline this. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You're equal in Christ in the fact that you are what? Joint heirs together of the grace of life. That's an equality that we desire. The creation order established the headship of the male and the helpership of the woman prior to sin. I want to make that point. Prior to sin. The equality of man and woman is seen in their like nature of being humankind, a shared divine purpose that would be fulfilled through divine wisdom by assigned roles to complement each other so that they could fulfill God's appointed task for humankind. The equality is further elevated and magnified by the wondrous truth that both could be heirs of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at this particular difference that they say does not exist before the fall, think about just a little bit from Genesis chapter 2. In the first place, by the way, actually chapter 1 kind of whispers the headship of man. Because although the term there is generic, the generic term for man, humankind is man. Why didn't we use the generic term woman? I'll leave that alone. But we, it's whispered. And, but we don't need a whisper. Uh, think about this group of verses in Genesis chapter uh, 2. The name for humanity, as I've mentioned, is the same as the male Adam. Genesis 1.27, Genesis 5.2. God created the man first, Genesis 2.7. The man is the recipient of the divine command prior to the creation of woman. The man is put in the garden to work, and the man is to do, we see him doing what? Well, we see that he names the animals. I wonder how many million years old he was when he named the animals. According to evolution view, he would have must have been a long time getting smart. Anyway, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help me for him. Now I've got to be careful what I say here. I wouldn't want to leave a long impression. But Adam, at this time, when he names all these beast creatures, and he gets none naming them, he notices what? That there's not one like him. You think he was a little lonely? Oh, by the way, just in passing, it takes a wise man to know the difference between loneliness and solitude. You folks who carry those weapons of distraction around in your pockets all the time may have some trouble. Leave that alone. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. He names them and there's no one like him. Now, like I said, I've got to be careful. Barbara would talk to me here. Uh, but just think about Adam thinking maybe Saturday night he'd like to have a date. He would just like to go over to the local drive-in and they'd have a nice milkshake and you'd have a nice conversation and drive back to the house and, and this is with purity you want to show a little affection so you just kind of want to give a little hug and poor old Adam looks at the situation and the only thing he could give a little hug to that would even be close fitting was a giraffe because nothing else would have a neck that would be suitable. He needed a what? He needed to help me. One that was suitable like him. And so it was. God created. 
Eve, one of his kind, that could help him do what God purposed for man to do as the supervision of this world. I know right now we're in big trouble. But anyway, now, now, we'll just quit with this. Anyway, I want to get this egalitarian viewpoint. Number one, they deny everything about Genesis 2 showing a distinction between male and female. They're denying the whole concept of headership and helpership. No, it's all equality back here. Now we recognize equality, but we also see a distinction. We already see that of distinction. Now furthermore, maybe if you could just worm around it a little bit, maybe you could take Genesis 1 and somehow say, well, no, no, no. But the point is the Bible shows, the Bible makes the argument for headship and helpership, not by going back to Genesis 3.16. But by going back to what? Genesis 1 and 2. And you're going to have to argue with the Bible itself if you're going to take, try and follow that other position. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8 and 9. 1 Corinthians, for the man is not the woman, but the woman the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Now the present day culture screams at such a statement. While it is revealing, man was in need of a fit helper, one like him to fulfill his role. Our general emotional climate just screams when it speaks of this idea, man made for woman. That's not the idea at all. That is a compliment to you ladies. Because here's one who's been made fitting to help complete God's overall picture of what humankind is going to do. Now, you always are going to have some men that's going to think they're bigger than what they are. So Paul puts them in place in verse 11 of 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. So he said, you fellows who just think you're something and your wives ought to do anything you want to. I just want to ask you a question. Did you have a mother, didn't you? You might be acting like you didn't have one, but you had a mother. You were born a woman. Then, of course, we've got 1 Timothy chapter 2. And the prohibitions in 1 Timothy chapter 2 regarding I have a woman not to teach or to exercise authority. What's the reason he gives? He says, for man was what? First formed. That's the reason. Now, the problem when you discuss the emotionality of gender difference, etc., is... There's a lot of cultural stereotypes and traditions that's hung on it that aren't necessarily need to hang on it. And we need to have the spiritual dis discernment to make that difference. I want to illustrate this about cultural traditions. Jess, Jesse and Hannah Grant, the parents of Ulysses Grant, Clara, Virginia, who was known around the house as Nellie, Orville and Mary Frances joined the Methodist since Hannah couldn't find a Presbyterian church on the Ohio frontier. The Grants worshipped in a 30 by 50 brick building church. While being small, it had two front doors, one to accommodate men and the other to accommodate women. The arrangement lasted until 1846. The parents of Grant meeting in brick building with two doors, one for men and one for women until 1846. Now that's an illustration of what I meant about cultural stereotypes getting hooked on. Now to fulfill the biblical matter, you don't have to have two doors, one for men and women. But you see what I mean? This is why this gets a little complicated. But now let's, let's shift the scene 171 years later. 171 while the assembly, when the assembly was dismissed and sundry Bible questions were being tossed about, the young preacher in his 30s and a good Bible student asked, would it be scriptural for husbands to sit with their wives and children in the assembly? This question was posed in October 2017 at the Regara building in Zimbabwe. You see what I'm illustrating? 
I'm illustrating handling a Bible principle of gender roles without letting cultural traditions get to the point that it creates an extra problem. It's true, traditionally, lines can be drawn that an application overstep the essence of the Bible teaching, creating unnecessary reactions in the long run to the goal of the scriptures. But it is also true, culture can slowly erase lines and application that deteriorates the essence of the Bible teaching on until due season disobedience enters without recognition. That's the battle. The egalitarian view is quick to consider all, I want, to get, I want you to get this. The egalitarian view is quick to consider all Bible references in the Word of God reflecting gender roles, gender roles as being cultural and situational. You bring up 1 Timothy chapter 2. You bring up 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You bring up Ephesians 5. They don't count. They're just cultural. They're just situational. What counts? Galatians 3 and 28. I ask a question. Is the book of Galatians situational? Of course it is, isn't it? But this is the point that they try to make. This is how they dismiss what they call the hard passages, which are far more clear than the unclear passages, that restricts, of course, women's roles. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. Let your women keep signs in the churches, not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, also saith the law. If they learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for women to speak in the church. 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, what I said earlier, I wasn't interested in just giving you a list of egalitarian arguments because I hope this will be meaningful, especially, well, I hope to all of us, but especially you younger folks. And when you look at me, that makes a lot of you younger, but anyway. Now, the cultural battle for the child of God is constantly engaged in, but the battle sometimes is unsounded to the young. For all of us look at life largely through the eyeglasses culture puts on us. But we don't realize the glasses are already tinted. Last week I had to go get some new glasses. The lady gave them to me and she gave me a little chart to see if I could still read. And I could. And I asked her, I said, have you tinted these glass lenses? Of course they weren't. And she looked at me. I said, have you tinted these glass lenses? And I said, what I mean is, have you tinted them with culture? Because I don't want to see out of these eyeglasses through the tinted eyes of culture. But you see, we all do this. We all do this, don't we? Now, what this means is for you and me as children of God, we have to constantly be a people who immerse ourselves in the scriptures. Because we need the word of God to be constantly polishing the lens. And if the word of God's not polishing the lens, culture's doing what? Culture's tinning the lens. Probably if I get through this point, I'll be done. I need to quit. I'm sorry. But anyway. Okay. Now, Paul calls culture. Here's what Paul calls culture. That is, culture is man's accumulated knowledge. It's man's accumulated knowledge. Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians 2 and 12, he calls it the spirit of the world. That's the same thing as culture. In contrast to divine inspiration, which is referred to the spirit which is of God. The accumulated knowledge of man has brought us many blessings. Some of you tonight wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the blessings of culture medically. But the point is this. When the accumulated knowledge is contrary to our faithfulness, we must not compromise the truth and still think we shall be among the overcomers. In 1 Corinthians 2 and 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given, uh, given to us. 
Let me see where I'm at. Now let me enter the modern world of technology. Uh, I pardon for the redundancy of this particular, uh, whatever you want to call it. It's redundant. I think the last time it publicly showed its eyes was in 2002. So uh, for some of you who always want something new, that, this will be rather redundant. But I want to share this with you, especially for the younger folks. And if this is all I get done tonight, that's okay. My brothers and sisters, we're in the battle of battles. The battle of battles. Let me see if I can go over here and see what happens. In past times, our general culture was probably more biblically oriented than what it is today. I mean, let's face it. Who ever heard of clergy ladies in the denominational church before the 80s? Right? So at this point, we have what? Culture, yes, has a larger influence in our view of the man, headship, helpership role. You told me not to touch the right one. Hey, I'm with, I'm with you, man. Uh-oh. What happens when, oh, I got it. I boasted too soon. <coughs> All right. Ah. Oh. Uh -oh. I knew this was going to happen. I'm not going to let it upset me. Point it towards your computer, Ron. Sorry. Oh, yeah. They have to have attention, don't they? they do. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can't ignore anybody anymore. Anyway. So now, here's, here's, here's what happened. Okay. In our present day and time, now, this is a teeter-totter or a seesaw. I remember we got in a big discussion of this back in 2002. Anyway, but you all know how it works. Okay. The heavyweight, right? He controls the... From my side of the street, it was a seesaw. To you folks uptown, it's a teeter-totter. Anyway, so this is the present situation. The cultural view of man and women is the heavyweight, and the Word of God is the lightweight. But for we who are members of the Lord's Church, we are people who will not compromise what is... We will not compromise being godly. This should be the role that we should have as the children of God. I'm a learner. Anyway, so this shows us what? This shows us the tension. Now you young men and women, you young married couples, This is what about for your spiritual life and your marriage. This is what it's about. And this is what about being an example to show unto the world the way of godly people. Now, in a living faith, the word of God is dominant and the spirit of the world culture is the lightweight. Think about the revisions we've seen in our lifetime, in our day and time, and how many of them, the revision of the scripture has been culture, and that's why men have changed their views. Let's take communion. Let's take communion. Man discovered germs. Germs. Nasty things. And so, if we drink out of one drinking vessel, we're going to all die. That's culture. I remember talking one time with a group of brethren who used cups 
I knew him pretty well, so I could say things with a smile. I told him, I said, I don't know why we're even arguing, because you think we're going to all die because we drink out of one cup. I said, we might die. The one Lord's church that uses one cup may die, but it won't be because we drank out of one cup. It'll be because we've either been unfaithful or the Lord has taken us home providentially. Anyway, enough of that. Music. When did you start driving down the road and it started talking about traditional services and contemporary services? When did that start? About, about the 80s? Where'd that come from? Because the denominational churches, they grew up, raised up a whole lot of young folks. They didn't know that in the first place you shouldn't use a mechanical instrument. And they wanted music like their music. And so there was a, things weren't very harmonious. And so we had a division. And so we had a division, but it was covert. We'll just have traditional services and we'll just have contemporary. And so if you want a boom boom, you can have that. If you just like amazing grace, that's okay. Women's roles. That's because of the cultural change. Now, I want you to think about this, please. A living faith is a faith that in culture will, will face all kinds of changes. And as we face those changes in the culture, we got to go back and compare our biblical stance with the cultural change. When I do that, I might find that I had hitched the horse too close to the hitching post. You see, I've brought in a couple traditions that with my argumentation that didn't need to be. Or I might find out that I didn't hitch my horse close enough to the hitching post. And so I've left in some things I shouldn't left in. So, unfortunately, what happens in the world in this battle, in a living faith, most people depart. But in a living faith, as you face culture and you keep studying your Bible, you become more committed to those Bible passages and that's a living faith. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. Pardon my back. I got to get over here. Oh, yes. Good. Good. Don't you love something that'll do what you say without back talking to you? Anyway. Uh, the egalitarian viewpoint is suspect. When they read the Bible, any positive example of prominence found in the scriptures like a Miriam or a Deborah or a Hulu, the egalitarian interpretation is, is God is gradually overcoming patriarchy. patriarchy. They'll say any prominent example shows that God's overcoming what happened here and he wants us to get here now how do they know that's right well it's right because male leadership's wrong that's the answer any example in the bible or negative oppression in the bible like rape or polygamy or adultery or divorce that shows the evil of a headship helpership system but the point is, how do they know that? Well, male leadership's wrong. What would be a better approach? What would be a better approach? Well, I think a better approach would be that in these positive examples of these wonderful ladies, such as Miriam, Deborah, Hulda, God is affirming the value of the ministry of women in the context of male headship. How do we know this? Because the scriptures never state that male leadership is wrong, but affirms it. And in 1 Peter 3, 5 and 6, the summary of the Old Testament shows what? That the ladies were in respect of their husbands, Sarah and Abraham. And that's a summary of what is good. Whenever you look at a negative example of aggression in the Bible, what's it pointing out? Rape, polygamy, adultery. How do we know that's wrong? Because the scriptures show that it's what? That it's wrong. 
The egalitarian strategy is suspect. It takes a group of texts text that is hotly disputed. And ever, if ever there's a passage that's disputed, this is their approach. Wouldn't it be a good principle of interpretation not to allow them any significant influence over our view of manhood and womanhood? I want to ask you something. What text in the Bible that is significant to the Christian is not disputed? Is baptism significant to us? Is it disputed? So since it's disputed, should we just forget about it? Just because verses dealing with women's roles and man's headship is disputed, we're just going to forget all about it? No. If there's one little thing in that verse that we don't understand, well, it says over there, if obedience to the law. I don't know what, the law, what that means there, so we've got to leave that out. Here's the point. They've assumed that incomplete knowledge is false knowledge. Incomplete knowledge is not false knowledge. But that's the assumption that's being made. Oh my. I was supposed to say something about Miriam, Deborah, and Hold. Okay. The question is, all three of these ladies are classified as prophetesses. They're all classified as prophetess. Miriam was a prophetess. Miriam is said by the egalitarians to have led the Israelites out of Egypt. Micah 6 and 4. I brought thee up. It said that Miriam did that. A careful study will show I think it's God that brought them, brought them up out of Egypt. The role of her as a prophetess that we have is she led the women in song. It's interesting that this prophetess, the basic things that we know in detail is that she did it with the ladies. Deborah is an absolutely magnificent example of a godly lady. And Deborah is found in the book of Judges. And you'll remember that Deborah was a prophetess. Uh, she was a mother and she sat under a certain tree and people came to her to receive judgments. At that time, the nation of Israel was being greatly threatened and they needed someone to rise up in battle as a military leader in the book of Judges. Most judges were military leaders. And Barak, of course, was not courageous enough to lead. And so as a prophetess, Deborah was the one that pointed out to Barak his duty. She said unto him in verse 6, Have not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw towards Mount Tamor. Take with thee 10,000 men of different tribes. You'll remember the story. And Barak said, he said, I won't go unless you go with me. We don't have time for all this. I want you to notice several things about this story. Check me out so that it's just not my bias, okay? She was a prophetess. A prophetess is one that receives a direct message from God. And she told Barak what God said. And it was not Deborah who went and summons the military. It was Barak. Now, my point is simply this. Holda, they went to Holda in the days of Josiah. Here's a couple of things I want you to know. Everything about the details of these prophetess involves either working with ladies or women and that these prophetess you'll never find them going out and making a beckoning to a public assembly or a public gathering and in reality the Deborah story I wish we had time for it 
The Deborah story, long run short is, short run long, whichever way that is. Anyway, uh, the point is, Deborah's a better example of someone encouraging male headship when male headship was too weak to get done what it should to get done. And Deborah is not an example that takes us from there to the idea of unrestricted ministry. If anything, this would be an example for godly ladies. If your husbands are not being as spiritually minded as they should, this is an example for you to appeal to them. Now I know sometimes it's hard to say things in a nice way, so let me just say it to you godly ladies. If your husband's a spiritual wimp, encourage him and help him to develop what skills he has for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now since I've been around a little bit, I'll tell something to you godly ladies. Now when you do this, be careful because as you tell him that several times to try and help him you have to realize that men when they're given good positive advice by godly ladies over a period of time men do not understand that as good they have another word for it they call it nagging so anyway that's just a little word but Deborah Miriam Holda, there's no examples here, even though they're prophetess, to remove the idea of male headship. Remember this, prophecy is a direct, is direct revelatory information. Teaching is not, especially in this day and age when the spiritual gifts are finished. If we were going to find something in the Old Testament, that would lead us to the idea that the ministry of women is to be unrestricted and the overseeing of women in the church is to be restricted. The best thing they could come up with is if they could show that there was a woman who was a priest. Because in the Old Testament, who was appointed to be the teachers of the law? It was the priest. It was the priest. Pardon me for giving you some numbers. But Leviticus 10 and 11. Deuteronomy 21 and 5. Malachi 2, 6 and 7. Nehemiah 8 shows a good example. The point is, you find no priests, women priests in Israel. That's interesting because other nations have what? Women priests. But not in Israel. That's a no-no. These passages, I know I'm being a little run overish, but these passages, in no way, when you look at the total picture of the Word of God, can be used to try and say unrestricted women ministry is all right. Besides, we have New Testament verses that prohibit. In the New Testament, we have Priscilla and Aquila. You're going to have to pardon me for this abbreviated form of speaking. Priscilla and Aquila. All you have with Priscilla and Aquila is you have a three-person conversation. So how are you going to get public women teachers out of that? You've got Phoebe, our sister, Romans 16 and 2. She's called a servant. The point is this, the term servant is a general term and can't without contextual evidence be used more specifically to speak of one as a deacon or a deaconist. Matthew 27, 55, and many women were there beholding far off which followed Jesus from Galilee ministering unto him. This word here where it speaks of her as a servant is a very general term. And this general term cannot turn around and be reclassified as a deacon or deaconess unless the context would show it. The word where it's pointed out, she's translated as sucker. That word simply means she's a patron. She's a helper. Besides, certainly 
Paul wouldn't say he came under a Phoebe. When we speak of these general terms, they cannot be applied to automatically say, well, this woman was a deaconess or she was an elder. It's a general term. You know, let's turn it around for a moment. What if you could come up with some good Bible evidence for a deaconess? Their work would simply be a mercy ministry. It wouldn't be authoritative to teach. It wouldn't be authoritative to govern the body. These passages are all general. I wanted to go in more detail, but that's my problem. But listen to this, please. I'm going to read this. The problem with taking the terms fellow worker or laborer to promote unrestricted female teachers and leaders in the church is the terms that are very general and take in a myriad of activities. The fact someone is mentioned as a fellow worker was involved in male leadership or teaching doesn't mean everyone under the label fellow worker was involved in leadership or teaching more than when one is mentioned as a fellow worker of Paul because he aided him in prison doesn't turn around and say that everyone who's a fellow worker had a prison ministry. It's a general term and the contextual setting has to bring it forth. These verses appear, appeal to be ambiguous enough to allow such possibilities, but they don't require them. Women elders, Titus 2, no. It is true that all elders are aged, but all aged people aren't elders. These were what? Aged women. You don't turn around and claim that makes them elders. The idea that uh, a woman's an apostle, a junior, that's kind of a present day problem. They can't decide whether junior was a male or a female. And secondly, the question outstanding among the apostles, what about the word apostle? The word apostle has a secondary sense. It's simply one sent out. Barnabas was referred to an apostle, but there's a very distinction between them and the 12 apostles. All right, I've got to quit. We didn't cover some cases. You can ask me in the question and answer period. I want to get this one right here. Galatians 3.28. You got your Bible open, George? Do me a favor. I could quote it, but I'm trying to hurry so much, I'll just bum follow it. Read me Galatians 3.28, please. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, thank you. Now, Galatians 3.28 is said when Christ came that he restored the original order. Okay? And all the passages of the Bible have to fall under Galatians 3.28. But the context of Galatians chapter 3.1 through Galatians what? 4.7? has nothing to do about the relationship of male and female and social implications. What's being discussed in Galatians 3, 1 through 4, 7? And that is how anyone can have a part of the inheritance, have the right to salvation. They take these pairings and say, this is all showing sinful relationships. It's just being a Jew and a Gentile, a sinful relationship. What's well, not? Is it unless you what? Yeah. Oh. Slave and free man. Well, that doesn't fit. Looks like that ought to be slave and master. If it's a sinful relationship. And, and male and female. It's just being male and female. Is, when God made, is that just a sinful relationship? 
Now that's what this is all applied to. This has nothing to do with any of that. What this is showing is, is that to the Judaizing teacher, the right to the inheritance and salvation could not come through the law, but through the promise. That's what this is about. Now, when you look at the pairings like that, look at it like this. In the law, who could receive an inheritance? Who could receive an inheritance? He had been a Jew, right? He'd have been a son, or we might say a free man, right? And he would have been a what? He'd have been a male. That's what this is talking about. Galatians 3.28, it says, Hallelujah. Every one of you can have a right to the inheritance by the promise of Abraham through the Lord Jesus Christ. What the egalitarian have done with this is what? They have tried to take... This, Galatians 3.28, shows how you can be on the team. But Galatians 3.28 doesn't say anything about what position you get to play. That's the confusion. That's the confusion. <coughs> There's the picture. All these passages that are clear about differentiation, differentiation of roles that are so clear in the Bible have to all bow before Galatians 3.28 and Galatians 3.28 doesn't have anything to do with it. And yet this is the fun passage. Now my brothers and sisters learn how this passage is magnified in the general religious world of egalitarianism because this is what you need to give an answer to. This is what it's about. To them, Galatians 3.28 is the normative passages. All other verses dealing with gender roles have to bow. The other verses are all problematic. A particular situation, time related, culture sensitivity, not transferable uh, today. Well, you've been more than gracious, Mike. I was uh, worried about what I was going to say. And a little voice said to me, Ron, don't be worried about what you're going to say. Just hope that after you say it, the other folks know what you've said. And so that's where I hush. <laughs>